I'm making this video because one of the things I've noticed over the years is that people really struggle to differentiate between ozone that's found up in the atmosphere in the stratosphere and ozone found at the surface of the atmosphere or in the troposphere. In this video, I want to really clearly try to delineate why these types of ozone are different in the atmosphere and why we have really different problems with ozone depending on where it's located in the atmosphere. As I just noted, the most important point to get out of this video is that tropospheric ozone is a different, completely separate problem from what we see with stratospheric ozone. So after watching this video, you should be able to describe the problems that occur with tropospheric ozone and then also explain why stratospheric ozone is important to life on Earth and why declines in ozone at the upper levels of the atmosphere are an important problem. The important thing to understand about the structure of the atmosphere is that we have what are called atmospheric layers. These layers aren't completely distinct from one another, but they function in different ways. The reason we call them layers is because of changes in temperature, pressure, and density as you go up in the atmosphere. For environmental science, we really are only concerned about the troposphere and the stratosphere. We live in the troposphere. This is where weather occurs, and this is where we experience air pollution most directly because we can be exposed to different types of pollutants. The top of the troposphere is somewhere around or just past the top of Mount Everest, and above this we transition into the stratosphere. Airplanes, for example, travel just at the bottom of the stratosphere, and the reason they do this is that there's far less mixing of the atmosphere once you go past the tropopause. On an airplane, you'd call this turbulence, and there's far more in the well-mixed and mixing air masses of the troposphere than there is in the relatively calm and somewhat distinct layer of the stratosphere. What this means for ozone is that the same O3 molecule can occur in the troposphere and also occur in the stratosphere, but that these reservoirs of ozone are distinct from one another and do not mix. So when ozone builds up at the surface of the Earth as pollution, it's a problem for us but it's completely distinct reservoir of ozone and completely distinct from the problems that we have with stratospheric ozone, um, which we'll talk about in the next couple slides. Very quickly, let's review the problem with tropospheric ozone. Although the reactions that produce tropospheric ozone are really complex, the basic idea is that volatile organic carbons plus nitrogen oxides react in the presence of light to produce ozone. Ozone, as we've talked about, is a major threat to health near the surface of the Earth. And importantly for this video, that ozone that we're talking about will last in the troposphere for a few hours to a day or so. This is not nearly long enough for this low-level atmospheric ozone to move up into the higher levels of the atmosphere where it could become stratospheric ozone. This just never happens. In the stratosphere, ozone plays a very different role in the global environmental system. At these high altitudes, incoming ultraviolet radiation from the sun reacts with ozone in ways that reduce the overall transmission of UV to the surface. In effect, this ozone layer is serving as a giant shield that reduces our exposure to ultraviolet radiation. Without this layer, we would have huge problems for life on the planet, and for humans this would include a massive increase in cancers, and it could arguably make the planet close to uninhabitable for certain types of life. The problem with ozone at this level of the atmosphere is a decline that has occurred as a result of uh, human use of chlorofluorocarbons. And we'll go through that in the next slide. I'm gonna simplify a lot of very complicated reactions here. And in fact, the folks that figured out how these reactions work won the Nobel Prize a number of years ago. But here's the basic story. Chlorofluorocarbons were produced as refrigerants, which are used in compressors that are found in refrigerators and freezers or air conditioners. The CFC molecule is really good for this because it's very unreactive, and in the troposphere it doesn't do much of anything at all, and in fact it just slowly floats up to the upper levels of the atmosphere over months to years. However, when CFCs hit the high energy environment of the stratosphere, they break apart and then the chlorine that is released from the CFC reacts in, with ozone in ways that convert the O3 molecule into an O2 molecule, ozone into oxygen, and in doing so reduces the ability of the ozone layer to filter out incoming ultraviolet radiation. The ozone hole forms up of, because of some very unusual conditions over the Antarctic continent. 
there are very strong winds that race around the Antarctic continent in the winter, closing off this air mass to mixing with the rest of the world. During that time in the dark, chlorofluorocarbons react over and over again to reduce ozone. At the end of the season, that hole breaks up and these ozone depleted air masses can move out over the southern um, hemisphere. Because of the serious concerns about ozone depletion, an international process was launched in the 1980s to create an agreement to phase out the use of chlorofluorocarbons. This agreement is called the Montreal Protocol and was established in 1989 and eventually ratified by the U.S. Senate. I'd like to note that this agreement on a major piece of environmental legislation occurred with bipartisan support and is a reminder that we can in fact get things done when we can find points of agreement in the United States. The Montreal Protocol phased out the use of the CFCs and has been modified a couple times to address other issues that have emerged in the last few decades. Overall, this agreement has been a very successful way to address the ozone losses, and the ozone hole itself is actually expected to be more or less um, gone by around 2040. This agreement is also a nice reminder that the international community can solve problems when nations interact in positive ways. To summarize, it should hopefully be completely clear now that tropospheric and stratospheric ozone do not mix, and that they play very different roles in the atmosphere. Tropospheric ozone is a major type of air pollution, as we've talked about several times. Stratospheric ozone protects us from ultraviolet radiation and has been declining as a result of chlorofluorocarbon emissions. Now we're seeing improvement as a result of the Montreal Protocol, which phased out the use of chlorofluorocarbons globally.